so uh, good morning for the fourth time i think i think we should uh, we should make a rule if you say good morning once loudly that should be enough right you don't need to keep saying good morning good morning good morning okay so do all of you know about mpeg or mp3 yes, sir. Does anyone here who doesn't know about MP3? Raise your hands, please. Don't worry, you won't get penalized. Okay, everyone does. Um, did you know that MP3 was designed, created, came out of Fraunhofer, our guests today? I'm sure you didn't know that. If anyone knew that and it is clear that they knew it, you might get a prize. Good. I'm glad to see that you guys are honest about this. Um, Let's see, you've done one physics course and half of the other. Have you studied Fraunhofer lines? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Huh? Yes, sir. You have? Yes, sir. Not sure? <laughs> Maybe you did, but now you don't remember. Okay, Fraunhofer lines. So I won't ask you uh, what they are, but uh, the Fraunhofer Society is named after Josef von Fraunhofer, who was a scientist, an engineer, and an entrepreneur. Uh, he was a German optician, he was like a master optician. So, and he was completely hands on, from glass blowing to this to this. He died at the age of 39, apparently from poisoning from glass blowing, gases. And he lived from 1787 to 1826. So, uh, with that, let me uh, welcome Mr. Frank Trepper, Director of Corporate Strategy and International Affairs of Fraunhofer, Ms. Silke Latvik, Advisor, Corporate Strategy and International Affairs, and Ms. Anand Yair, Director of Round Offer India. Um, I have a short speech, it might get a little long, so please don't fidget. Okay. Or if you think it's too long, raise your hand at the back, I will cut it down. Okay, so Fraunhofer is one of our, uh, see part of our strategy as a university is to, uh, is to link with industry, and industry include manufacturing, consulting, and your world of work and to link with R&D. Ultimately, the best education happens with industry, R&D, and academics and student come together. Right? You see many aspects. So you know that we have uh, worked out a collaboration with uh, two premier CSR national labs, Central Building Research Institute, Roorkee, and Central Scientific Instrument Organization, Chandigarh. And you start to see, over time, projects coming in. With Fraunhofer, we worked out, a, we signed a letter of intent. So we've taken the first major step. And our guests are here for the next two days, today and tomorrow, for us to work out what will be the framework of how we work with it. That's very important. You don't just jump into something. You plan for it, you think in advance, you look at what's required. So that's what we're going to do for the next two days. Um, what is of, should be of interest to you students is that over time, we'll identify student projects where you can work with Fraunhofer experts. And these will be interdisciplinary and with an experimental approach and applied engineering. Not pure science, pure engineering. Which is exactly what you know, we are looking for. Right? So Fraunhofer has a, it's a German research organization with a 67 institute spread through Germany. Employs uh, over 20,000 people. Some of the data might be old, so I didn't check it with Frank. Uh, has a budget of a research budget of over two billion dollars a year, and so on. What is unique about them is that uh, more than 70 percent of the funding comes through industry requirements. So they don't take up projects just for the sake of taking up projects. Someone has to have a need, and the need usually comes from industry and some government funds. And that makes them uh, unique in the context of research worldwide. And again, something that you want to do. So it was founded in 1949. Uh, there's a lot of background that I won't get into right now. Uh, let me just give you a short background on Frank Trepper, Sir Kalatrik, and Anandi Ayer, our guests here. So Frank is the Director of Operative Strategy and International Affairs of Fraunhofer. He is a mechanical engineer. He graduated at the Technical University in Aachen in Germany. His professional career started in 1982 at the Fraunhofer Institute for Production Technology in Aachen. He held a senior position, leadership position at different institutes, Germany and the US. Uh, he's set up Fraunhofer US and was there for quite a while. Uh, today he's a member of the top management team of Fraunhofer, uh, located in Munich. But as he was saying, 
his uh, a flat is in Munich, he lives somewhere else, and he's on a plane most of the time. <laughs> that, that's, that's the vice president. Okay. Uh, he's also the vice president of the steering committee of the European Association of Research and Technology Associations. Ms. Silke Latvik, a advisor to the director on corporate strategy and international affairs. Her background is communication and sales. Can you hear me clearly in the back? Yes, you're still awake at the back? Good, excellent. So her background is communication and sales. Uh, she uh, graduated in foreign languages, philosophy, and communications at York, 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 August University in Gottingen, Germany. She worked with different other judicial agencies, and finally was made responsible for that. Um, she was in charge of corporate communication at Haug and Hauser, private bankers, one of the oldest asset managers in Germany. So she's had extensive experience in terms of global experience. Uh, then she started a foundation in uh, formation and sustainability management. And uh, since 2014, she's been working with Fran Offer in Munich. Uh, Ms. Anandi Ayer, whom we have been working with for a while to get to this point, has uh, more than 22 years experience in the field of technology, cooperation, R&D. Her focus has been on transnational cooperation, so across, across countries, across continents. She worked out partnerships between industry, research, and government um, in fields such as biotechnology, renewable energy, electronics, new materials, and so on. Um, Fraunhofer India last year, she was uh, awarded the Outstanding Woman Achiever by the Public Relations Council of India. She brought in $8 million of research projects in four years. So that's a remarkable achievement. So our goal, Fraunhofer's goal and our goal over the next two days is to transform our uh, guest host relationship into becoming partners. So that's what we're aiming for the next stage. So, ladies and gentlemen, please again welcome Frank Trevor. Uh, he will be he will deliver a lecture on joy of engineering. Sounds like a familiar subject. Very good. Half of you went through it last semester and looks like most of you enjoyed it. Some didn't you figure it out, and the other half are going through it this semester. Right? What a nice welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Mitra, Dr. Kumar, distinguished professors, dear students, liebe Studenten and Studentinnen. I have to learn German now. I am happy to be here. We started this discussion about a year ago, and uh, I met Mr. Munjal several times, and the first thing he always said, well, it's still another 127 days, almost 72 days. So he was really excited to get to this point that the first group of students is here and we are very honored to be one of the first international guests, I hope and assume, to talk about a subject that cannot be more interesting than one that you chose, joy of engineering, or better could one say, to get excited about what you are all up to. Um, the next couple of days, today and tomorrow, you will see uh, wide range of different um, fields within engineering. You may not be familiar with all of them yet, I must say, your professor certainly will. So he was really excited to get to this point that the first group of students is here and we are very honored to be one of the first international guests, I hope and assume, to talk about a subject that cannot be more interesting than one that you chose joy of engineering, or better could one say, to get excited about what you are all up to. Um, the next couple of days, today and tomorrow, you will see a wide range of different um, fields within engineering. You may not be familiar with all of them yet, I must say, your professor certainly will be, uh, but you may not yet be but it will give you an idea what you are heading for. And that is one of the best disciplines you can choose, you have chosen, in order that you still have to decide in which core field you want to continue. But India is a strong player in engineering, has the brightest minds uh, 
Anneli Ayer just returned from Hannover. She was with the delegation of your prime minister who opened the world's largest industrial fair with our Chancellor Merkel in Hannover. And have any idea how many companies from India joined this fair? Any thought? Sorry? 10,000 companies. Well, Lufthansa would have enjoyed that one. <laughs> no, but it's 350 companies that are exhibiting uh, at the Hanover Fair, which is the world's largest industrial fair, and you will see all fields that uh, you are about to look into over the next few semesters. So there's a lot going on in this area, and engineering, as I said, is one of the key drivers of economy in Germany, but also in India. Um, we all need engineers, we all need people like you. Before I start, let me ask you, I know that you have some, some six core disciplines, which is civil engineering and computer sciences and electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Are all of you already set and know where to go? Who will pick up civil engineering? Just one person, two, three, four, and mechanical engineering. Seems to work. Solve the focus. Computer sciences. Probably the rest. Okay, it's a good mix. And electrical engineering. So it's a good mix of, of all the disciplines here. Very good to see because you will see. Uh, even though I may focus. Um, application-wise on uh, automobile industries and aircraft industries, uh, but these industries need all of these disciplines. Now, joy of engineering, let me start with a word, a proverb that some wise Chinese uh, said, and I hope we will get through that uh, over the next couple of days, not through the first one. Tell me and I will forget. That's not what I want you to do. The next one is, show me, and I will remember. That is something we would like to do. We here at the university, but also we at Fraunhofer. And the best one is, involve me, and I will understand. And I would encourage you, like to encourage you that you also try to get involved, even in these uh, two days. Ask whenever you think it might be worthwhile to uh, ask, because if you don't understand something I'm going to say, or you would like to know a little more. But involve me and I will understand is also something we will offer at the end. So whoever will attend the second presentation tomorrow will see at the very end that is one of the offers we as Fraunhofer would like to make. Get you involved in the number of uh, technologies that we stand for. And Dr. Mitra told you already about the size of Fraunhofer. Um, it's an organization with 24,000 people and all of them are scientists uh, most of them are engineers. So that is really what we stand for, and 24,000 people working in the field of engineering, it could take a while before you really know uh, what Fraunhofer is doing. So I have to pick a focus and uh, try to give you at least a glimpse of what we are doing and what engineering really is, is standing for. This is not about Fraunhofer, but since Fraunhofer is probably the largest organization in Europe uh, involved in engineering, where you will always see a lot of what Farnham is doing. Now, if you start with engineering as such, um, there are a few challenges. And let me give you at least the three of them. And the first one is the innovation cycle. Um, but if you look at what's going on in these days, just take the first one, uh, the, the phone and telephone, uh, you know how dramatically the speed has changed. When it's doing the calls over the internet, uh, you use your computer, you use Skype, um, just look at the, the left one, Apple. Apple is bringing out a new version probably every six months. So that is really a big demand for all those engineers that, that want to serve the market and Apple is probably the only one who doesn't even need to explore the market. They designed their own market. But in the uh, telephone business, mobile phones, communication technology, 
the speed is dramatically high. So one has to be very, very fast and has to be excellent in this business in order to stay in the market. If you have a product now, that's fine, but if you want to have it in this market in six months, then you have to do a lot in order to stay ahead of your competition. And the uh, telephone business is a perfect example for that. Looking into the automobile business, the next one, it, it's certainly a long way to get from the left one to the, to the right one. Um, the right one is an electrical vehicle, um, which is probably the focus of all automobile manufacturers in these days. They either design electrical vehicles, full electrical vehicles, or hybrid vehicles. But uh, here again, the, the innovation cycle is uh, significantly decreasing. It used to take about seven years to design a new car. If you see now what's going on, how fast new generations come out, it probably doesn't take uh, more than three years now uh, to design, fully design a new car. And every four years, uh, you have a new version of an existing uh, model. So you have uh, decreasing innovation cycles, but increasing numbers of variants. Um, look at any of the uh, OEMs, how many different types uh, they are bringing around the road. And uh, the last one, the planes, um, they are only, at this point at least, two major uh, manufacturers of large-scale planes, uh, Airbus and Boeing. Uh, there's a new one in China coming up, but there are many, many small uh, manufacturers or manufacturers of small uh, planes, I must say, uh, business type of jets. My wife is, is a business jet, so I know how fast um, these uh, products are also changing, and that's definitely one of the most challenging products, aircrafts, um, designing a jet. It, it takes a long time to get the, the license uh, uh, for a jet manufacturer to bring it into the market, but uh, even these jet manufacturers have to be fast. They design very expensive products which are supposed to last very long. A plane like uh, this one here, 747, probably is supposed to be in service for at least 30 to 40 years. With every few years or uh, a few thousand working hours, uh, they disassemble the entire plane, assemble it again, and make sure that it works like a brand new one. Yeah, I don't think uh, Frank's wife is a jet pilot. Okay. I don't know about it. Either. That sounds sounds unique, but we came on a plane uh, to Delhi with a jet with a female pilot. So uh, they are coming. Uh, it's, it's great to see that uh, this discipline is now also um, taken over by female pilots. Another challenge uh, in engineering is the huge uh, variety of, of, of uh, dimensions that uh, you will address. I mean, there are certainly large-scale uh, um, structures, be it this um, multifunctional milling center that you see in the top left, uh, be it oil platforms. Uh, so there are a lot of very large-scale products um, that uh, engineers are supposed to design. It's a single piece production. Uh, you may only produce one piece uh, and, and not, not a second one. Same with this uh, tool, that's the right uh, picture. But then there are other pieces, and then it gets really challenging, like uh, this injection nozzles. That's a high volume component. Uh, it goes into diesel engines, and, uh, and these injection nozzles, it's in, in this case the company Continental, it produces 10 million parts a year. And the challenge about it is that what the right picture shows, this uh, small scale uh, hole, it's 85 microns, and if it turns out to be 87 or 82, then the diesel engine may have a problem. And just imagine what happens um, if 10 billion parts have the wrong size, or if just two or three have the wrong uh, dimensions, and the company has to recall uh, the, the automobiles. So this is, uh, from a production point of view, 
manufacturing point of view, one of the most challenging components that you can imagine. Now, this 85 microns may not tell you that much. Uh, when I was putting this slide together, I thought, how, how do I explain what this size is all about? What are 85 microns? It's, you can't show it. So let me try to explain what this uh, challenge of from micro to uh, macro to micro designs really means. And I, I use this uh, logarithmic scale. Uh, 10 to 0, you know how much of this in, in meters? It's one meter, right? So the right end is one meter, and that's where we start. I don't want to get into the macro uh, scale. And I uh, would like to use the mostly you know, the fields of uh, microelectronics as an example of what, what this size uh, means. In microelectronics, you find a, a typical wafer diameter in these days of 200, sometimes 300 millimeters. So it's that size that you have to produce in this uh, silicon wafer, uh, which is at least the size that one can, can imagine. Um, one chip may be the size 7 to 7 square millimeters, and I will get to this particular one uh, a little later. The substrate thicknesses, they go down to 50 microns. So 50 microns thickness of the, the silicon wafer in the end, uh, that, that's the basis for your, for your chip. And what is 50 microns? It's the same size as a human hair. So it's not that much. But it gets smaller. Uh, next uh, scale, half of that would be a birch pollen, 25 microns. And I used that because I didn't find a perfect example for the next uh, dimension. This 10 microns thin wafer. So in these days, your uh, production is capable of producing foils as micro waves, uh, micro uh, uh, in, in microelectronics. So the, the chips are produced as a as a thin wave which you can put on any on the windows or what, whatever you would like to wear. But it's very often used in, for security issues um, to protect um, uh, components or products from being stolen. That's when you get down to this, this size of uh, 10 microns. But it gets even smaller. In microelectrical mechanical systems, the structuring of really very fine uh, components, you get down to one micron. This is a machine that's capable of producing structures one micron wide. Now, what is, what is one micron? One micron is the size of a bacteria. So again, something you cannot really, really imagine. Um, but it gets still smaller. Now, this bird is not 10 nanometers, but I want to show you what 10 nanometers mean. If this bird would land on a super tanker, this super tanker goes down 10 nanometers. So you have 500,000 tons, and a bird that weighs maybe one kg lands on this tanker, and it sinks down 10 nanometer. Not that much, right? But it gets even smaller. If <coughs> you don't have a seagull but a sparrow, it's just one nanometer. So this is really the size where the dimension where production engineers are getting to very, very small, and that brings you to uh, the level of molecules. Uh, the size is about one nanometer, and in microelectronics, the silicon atom just has a, a dimension of um, 0 0, uh, 0 0.3 nanometer. So it's a very wide range, even in the micro scale, that uh, Manufacturing, microelectronics, engineering takes place. It's easier to go to the right side, to go beyond one meter, than you have this oil pump, for example. Uh, everybody would consider that to be a pump, but what you also see that, that what's shown on the right side is a pump. It's a micro pump that is used in medicine uh, with a sweat volume of 200 nanoliters. So, to provide the body with a certain volume of, of medicine, one does use these uh, micro pumps. 
they even get smaller than this one. This is seven by seven square millimeters. Uh, we produce these micro pumps that are about a tenth of this size and implant them on your inner eye. So that's for, for people who have some problems with the eye pressure. We can use these micro pumps to correct the eye pressure. So it really gets small, and that is one application within micro electronics. <coughs> Another challenge uh, that we are facing in, in engineering is the wide range of materials, new materials, high strength materials. And what you see here is how um, the composition of materials for an aircraft has changed over the last 40 years. In 1917, uh, the Airbus had about 4% of carbon fiber reinforced plastics, the CFRP, uh, and most of the rest was aluminum. And then just see how that has changed uh, over the time. Uh, the newest one that's about to come out, the Airbus uh, 350, as well as the Boeing um, 787, they are composed of more than 50% of carbon fiber reinforced composites. Very light material, high strength material, but extremely difficult to work with, um, to machine, and that's a material class on its own. If you are a designer, for example, of um, this aircraft, or of cars, or of machine tools, or any other fields of application, you work with this uh, type of material. You see here how this has changed for Boeing and, and Airbus over the years um, and uh, how they, they look in these days. The Boeing 777, which is still a young plane, hasn't been around for, for that long, uh, had almost 80% aluminum for the body structure. Uh, in, in these days, you see the 787 and the A350, which is this light blue uh, field. It's mostly composites, and it's increasingly titanium, another material, very light, high-strength material, um, which is extremely difficult to machine, which is a challenge to uh, those of you who want to become manufacturing engineers. So is engineering really joy? Um, big question. After having been in this field for more than um, 35 years, I would still say yes, absolutely. But one can make a lot of mistakes. I will show you one now. And that's when you start with a new product idea. That's always the beginning of everything, right? Uh, but what happens if somebody has this idea and who comes up with these ideas? Uh, somebody in the company has a funny idea. It may be the boss who just wants it uh, to be done. It may be the competitor who forces your company uh, to do something about your product, uh, otherwise you have the feeling it will be pushed out of the market. So there are many reasons why one could start thinking about a new idea. And then the way it goes, uh, you tell it to somebody in the company and he listens to you as your friend and says, okay, let's, let's do it. Go ahead. Then it goes through the entire engineering process, you do all the design, you do the layout of the manufacturing processes, the planning processes, your, the prototyping comes with the first new product. Uh, I still have the feeling it was a great idea. You go to the first exhibitions uh, and in the latest in Hanover, um, somebody might have a problem because the salesman uh, is telling you, um, well, this is the 56 new feature and you must have it, but the customer says, I'm running away from it. This is not my thing. So what went wrong? Um, somebody forgot to ask the market about this, this new idea. Joy is essential for engineering, definitely, but just having a nice idea is not enough. Engineers really have to focus on the need. There has to be a customer, there has to be a market who is asking for the product that you want to design, unless you are Apple. Apple has a different way of doing things. But all the other companies, they have to make sure that uh, they address a need, that they know their customer, that they know their market, 
and so they have not only internal feedback from colleagues and friends, but external feedback from the market who says, yes, this is the way to go and we want to have it in three months or right, two years. So engineering does play a very central role. It, uh, that's definitely true for an organization like, like ours, uh, the lives of engineering. It uh, provides the means to convert research results, and in our case, applied research, so we are not, not dreaming, we are not doing things out of curiosity. It's applied research, and we convert these results into innovative products uh, and services, and those that we know the market uh, wants to have. Engineering also makes a substantial contribution um, to the economy. Um, in Germany, would not be able to live in terms of the economy without engineering. Uh, all we do is export, and uh, we export high-tech products. So engineering is the crucial discipline, and the same thing uh, is getting true more and more true for India. If you see what's happening in, in your country, problem is and challenges, but also an opportunity for those who want to become an engineer. Technologies keep on changing fast. Disciplines have been around for, for quite some time, but no matter which uh, manufacturing technology you look at, it's still changing. One would think, well, everything has been examined, everything is known, and we know how to produce this and that part of the machine, this and that material, but that's not the case. Uh, there are new technologies coming out uh, almost every year. Uh, existing technologies keep on and changing fast, and one way uh, to describe engineering, I found this uh, it's a publication, a recent publication of the Royal Academy of Engineering that describes best what you are doing here at the university, where you are heading. Uh, just read it. Engineering is pervasive in our modern society, enabling every sector from communication and entertainment to finance and healthcare as well as its more visible applications in construction, manufacturing, and transport. So engineering addresses really all kinds of industries. Uh, you may know by now which core discipline you will take uh, down the road here, but you will not yet know how open the door is uh, to many industries that you can work with, with your qualification uh, as an engineer. Now let's look a little uh, into uh, Fraunhofer, the organization that um, I represent and Dr. Mitra uh, introduced you probably better than I can do it now. Um, we, in our namesake, that is this uh, scientist, Joseph von Fraunhofer, who lived some 200 years ago. Um, and the unique thing about him was he was a researcher, discovered the Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum, uh, these, these black lines, these lines. Uh, he discovered these lines and uh, used them to um, verify the quality of, of glass because he was really interested in, in glass works and, and designed optics. But he was not only a researcher. The interesting thing about him is that he also was an inventor. Uh, he developed a lot of new methods for manufacturing of optics. And then the crucial and last step, and that's why we decided to uh, choose his name uh, for our organization, is he also was an entrepreneur. So all the way from research, having an idea, through developing this, this idea into a new technology, a new product, to selling it, that's what uh, Joseph von Fraunhofer stood for more than 200 years ago. Uh, that's why we decided uh, to use his name uh, for our organization. And our organization, as you see here, uh, it's a map of Germany. Uh, and where were you? You see a little green dot. That's where we have an institute. So we have a, an overall organization called Fraunhofer. And then under the, let's, let's call it ruling for a moment, under this whole link, you find at this point some 67 institutes and uh, another probably 30, 35 uh, research entities just within Germany. So wherever you go in, in Germany, you will 
could see a frown of our institute. Definitely if there is a, an industry and definitely if there is a university because all of these institutes work very, very closely uh, with universities as my next slide show. And you see the research volume that we have, uh, it's, it's more than uh, two billion dollars at this point, which means every year we have to, to do a lot of work and in our case work with and for industry. That, that's why I keep on um, advertising and advocating the focus on the need of industry. And that is the way that, that Fraunhofer is working. We work for some 6,000 companies a year in more than 10,000 projects. So companies use us as their external engineering department. They, they come to us if they are interested in either solving a problem that they have or in developing the next uh, generation of products. We work with the OEMs uh, as much as we do with small and medium-sized uh, companies. So this is the way that uh, Fraunhofer works and that's, this is our mission that we promote and conduct applied research for the benefit of private and public enterprises and the society uh, as a whole. We do that mostly in Germany, so there's 24,000, probably more than 23,000 are based in uh, Germany. But as you see here, uh, we are also spreading out all, all over the world. Um, all the yellow dots represent um, other front of our subsidiaries where we have an uh, international daughter company, so to speak, the largest one being in the US. And that's a form of a USA with seven centers. But we are also in Chile and we are different places in uh, Europe. On the eastern side, uh, we have uh, various types of collaborations. We have representative offices, marketing offices. We have um, uh, project centers. So uh, we work very often with strategic partners together and, and set up a team for a uh, time of um, maybe three years and work on some exciting new topics. So you see Fraunhofer is doing its business uh, quite internationally. And if you have a chance to visit uh, Fraunhofer Institute, uh, you will see that all of them are as well equipped as any company in the market. Uh, Fraunhofer really um, focuses on uh, market type of equipment, production type of equipment, be it, uh, as is shown here in manufacturing, be it in microelectronics, we have uh, several uh, clean room uh, facilities where we do the microelectronics. Um, we have modern um, labs where companies can come to us and use our equipment in order to test what, what their new ideas might be on board. If their new technology would really work, they come to us and use you know, our equipment in our labs. So we also do very often the prototyping for companies. Because if you develop, if you as an engineer, design a new product, design a new technology or a process chain, you have to make sure that it will work in the end for the company. So before the company decides to invest uh, millions and millions of dollars into a new technology or a new equipment, um, they have the opportunity to uh, use you know, power facilities and produce the first 10,000 parts, for example, um, at Fraunhofer. 